So up here you see, may you live in interesting times. Many of you may know that phrase as the, quote, Chinese curse. It isn't. It isn't Chinese at all. It was actually, as far as anyone can tell, invented in the UK in the late 19th century. And there are actually three curses, right? There is this one, may you live in interesting times. There is a curse that says, may you find what you're looking for. You can think about why that could be a curse. And the third curse, and one of my favorites for another day, um, is may you come to the attention of the authorities. <laughs> but I wanted to use this curse for a, a, a bit of a talk today because I believe that we all, and you in particular, are going to live in interesting times for the next several years. And here's why. That is you. That is me. There's not much in between. And what's happening right now in the developed world, and this, is, this graphic is true for most of the developed world, but not otherwise, is that the peak spending period for consumers is in the period between 45 and 49. And look what's happening to the population. It's all older than that. And what that means to you is that consumer spending is unlikely to recover for demographic reasons. And it will be, this is good news and bad news for you, I suspect, a long time before you're 45 to 49. In fact, I suspect there are very few people in the room in their late 30s or early 40s. And a whole lot of people younger than that and a few people older than that. And here's what that's meant to spending so far. You can see three recessions on this curve. The recession at the top, this is the 2001 recession, the shallowest recession that we've had since World War II. And you can see that consumer spending barely hit a, a bump, right? This is the, probably the first recession many of you experienced, this one here, this is the 1991. That was a little tougher recession. There was a little more of a gap, but you can see that consumer spending recovered and got on a fairly rapid growth path fairly quickly. This is the recession that we're experiencing today. And you can see that the economists have put a period on it, 2007 to 2009, but the fact of the matter is, you know, spending is still barely where it was when the recession started, and the, the typical consumer-led recovery isn't occurring and looks like perhaps that it won't occur. And that drives you to this. This is every recession since World War II. And what you see on this graph is unemployment from where unemployment was at the start of the recession, how far it went down, and then all the way till it, it recovered to unemployment being at the same level it was before the recession started. The red lines, the real deep red lines here, that is immediately after World War II. And as you can imagine, as we came off the war effort, there was briefly a lot of unemployment, but you can also see while it was deep, it recovered very quickly, one of the earliest recoveries of the recessions that are graphed here. Every other recession, for the most part, you know, goes, you get a downturn, some deeper than others, but recovery is somewhere between 15 and 25 months. Unemployment is back to the levels that it was before the recession. There's one exception to that, one or two exceptions, but one in particular. That is that 2001 recession that I just showed you where consumer spending just powered right on through. And while there was a long time to recover unemployment, it was relatively shallow unemployment. This curve right here in the ugly orange is today. That's the economic world that we are in as we face today. And in my view, what that tells us, coupled with the data about the, the demographic data, is that it is unlikely there will be any recovery of employment in the near future. And by that I mean in the next five to ten years. And that there's very little our government is going to do to fix that. So what we're telling our people, our employees, is 
This environment, the world we're in today, is the environment we're going to face for the next 10 years, and get on with it. There's no advantage in waiting for it to get better, because I don't believe that it will in any meaningful way. So, what is that? Let me, let me just give you a sense of what that means is going on. Sorry, I've got to get my iPad to advance to, the, to my notes here. Okay. Um, what that means is that the economic situation will be one where, there, where there's more jobs and more growth outside the developed world. What it means is that there'll be global competition for the jobs that are out there. There'll be global competition, whether it's for construction materials or, or technical insight. And that all of, all of us, but especially all of you, are going to be competing for jobs on a global basis. We have a fairly large engineering operation in India, about 5,000 people. Right now, we can land an hour of engineering services in the United States from India for $45. A corresponding hour of engineering from the United States delivered in the United States is more than $100. What does that mean to the competitiveness of engineering services in the United States? We face big challenges. The world is increasingly asynchronous in terms of engineering services. They can be done anywhere. There are parts of our services that have to be done locally. Maintenance work has to be done locally. Construction work mostly has to be done locally, although you can modularize a significant part of it. But when you think about engineering services, only a small part of the engineering services that are, going, that are being delivered today or are going to be delivered in the future have to be delivered locally. So that means all of us find ourselves in a very different competitive market, and it, it does mean it's going to be tougher for new graduates. So what do you do? You know, what, what's going to make a difference between getting a job and having an opportunity and career, uh, and perhaps not? You know, I think this school does better than lots in placing its graduates. So you're lucky to be here. But I think there are things that you can do that will make your chances significantly better. And the first thing I'd suggest is find ways to make yourself uniquely valuable. And the, and the important part of that is finding ways to make yourself uniquely valuable. Right? If you just can't be one of the run of the mill. You can have broader skills. You can have greater depth of knowledge. You can go out and have experience that's relevant to the job before you go looking for it. You know, internships are a, a very strong way to increase your chances of getting not only a, a job, but a good job. But, but you really do have to, I believe, have to find ways to make yourself more valuable before you graduate. You know, I've been very impressed with, with some of the projects I've seen around the university and some of the things that people are doing that are sort of what I would characterize as practical hands-on opportunities to, to increase your skills and knowledge. And I would encourage you, if you aren't already, to participate in those things very aggressively and, and add that sort of practical experience to what you're doing, because there's huge value in that. You need to be prepared to market yourself. There is no question that all of us who are in making hiring decisions are susceptible to the way you come across. So it starts with what I'll call collateral materials, you know, the, the marketing papers, your resume, how you write about yourself, how you write about your interests, your needs, your future, all that's critically important. Presentation skills, how you present yourself, the confidence that you exude in one-on-ones in -on and in group situations has a significant impact on how good people think you are. That may not mean that the best person gets hired, but that's just the nature of the beast. So if you're not involved in something that will enhance your presentation skills, I would encourage you to do so. Toastmasters, 
anything that you can get involved in to make you more effective communicator will be hugely valuable. And it would be particularly valuable in the context of, of the paradigm about engineers not being good communicators, right? I didn't know how to spell engineer, now I are one. You've all heard that joke, right? Well, that, that's, that, that paradigm we know is not true, but it really helps if you come across as, as the kind of person that's clearly not true about. So I would encourage you strongly to work on your presentation skills and, and be able to show the person you're talking to what makes you special. One of the things I do as a hobby is, is I shoot sporting clays, clay targets, competitively. And, and my coach, uh, who's, who's quite a good coach in lots of ways, reminds me periodically that if you don't put your lips on that horn and blow it, who's gonna? And that's absolutely true. If you're not willing to tell somebody what makes you special, you're leaving them to guess. And, and you're missing the power of the, uniquely, the unique qualities that you all have to convince somebody you're the, you're the best choice. So what makes you special? What else? When you're in that job interview process or you get the job, what should you do? Leave home. The dean may not like me saying this, but, but you need to get away from wherever you're comfortable. Right? If, if you're comfortable in Wichita, Kansas, you know, at least get out of Kansas. If you're comfortable in the United States, get out of the United States. Make yourself a part of a global, multicultural world that we're all going to live in for the rest of our lives. Volunteer for it. Aggressively pursue it. Because there's where the opportunity is, and there's where the promotions will come from. But if you're comfortable, you're in the wrong place. You need to stretch yourself and you need to volunteer for things that will get you out of your comfort zone. Another thing I would encourage you to do in the interprocess process and after you get hired, be energetic. We see literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of smart people. I mean, most people who graduate in an engineering discipline are pretty smart people. What we don't see are smart people who are willing to work hard. That willing to work hard, that willing to do your day job and volunteer for something extra, that energetic quality is what separates you from your peers, what gives you the opportunities to demonstrate new skills or to learn new skills. So I, I really believe that being energetic, volunteering for more, has a huge power for you.